spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Aloha and good morning. Thanks for joining us here on this Aloha Friday morning. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, we are shining the spotlight back in time, going and catching up with a familiar face, someone who was very present, obviously, during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's right. We are welcoming in former director of the Department of Health, Dr. Bruce Anderson, to join us. Dr. Anderson worked at the health department for over 40 years and was at the helm when COVID-19 took hold here in Hawaii. He's now uh, splitting his time between here and the mainland, and we're so happy to welcome you. Thank you for being here. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Ryan. So so it's been some time, of course, uh, since you left the department and we have the benefit of hindsight. Uh, in your estimation, now that we have all this time since you left, how do you think that time was? What are your reflections on you know, those first few months uh, of the pandemic? Well, those first few months were, uh, I think, um, challenging for everyone. Um, the virus had just been discovered and, and no one knew much about it. Uh, rumors were flying around about how contagious it was and how deadly it was. Um, I, I think one of the uh, most difficult things from a manager standpoint uh, uh, was how little federal guidance we were getting uh, on what to do. Uh, unlike many outbreaks that I was involved with um, earlier, dengue fever and other um, significant health concerns, um, the, the guidance we were getting from the federal government was, was um, was inconsistent. And I think in, in their defense, uh, it was partly because, uh, well, we didn't know much about the modes of transmission. Um, you may remember uh, for a while, masks were not recommended uh, and people were focusing on wiping surfaces down. And, and, uh, and that changed, of course, pretty quickly. But having said that, um, uh, everyone was struggling, uh, trying to find out how it was transmitted and, and, and how to best prevent uh, prevent illness. Um, but I think the lack of federal guidance, particularly from CDC, was a real issue for all health directors. Um, um, maybe it was because of the Trump administration's um, um, concern that this be blown out of proportion and be a, uh, presented as a much more serious problem than it, than, it, than, it, than it was. Of course, it has turned out to be a, a, a huge issue for everyone alive across the world today. But we said that um, it, it was a tough uh, few months. We didn't have a vaccine, of course. We knew something about the transmission um, and uh, coming up with ways to um, prevent uh, illness was was challenging. Um, I must say that fifth, that uh, 14 day quarantine period was was extraordinarily effective in Hawaii, as it was in New Zealand and other isolated areas. Um, that's what kept our rates down to um, just a few every day. In fact, we had a, a many days during those first few months where we in Hawaii weren't, weren't seeing any new cases. And that was largely because of the, uh, the quarantine period. And we were seeing new cases. Uh, almost all of those cases were associated with travel. There were people who went to uh, Asia, uh, uh, other parts of the world, and, and uh, Las Vegas and other places and came back to Hawaii. I, I think um, something like 95% of the cases were travel related. It was brought here by someone traveling. And, and fortunately we were able to uh, identify most of those individuals and, and uh, get them into isolation. And, and uh, that was our, our bottom line strategy for, for those first few months. Um, obviously masks were important, but it was, um, it was challenging uh, to, to come up with ways that we could uh, uh, prevent the spread of the disease. One of the things that we saw evolve, you know, over time, of course, was some of the policies, but also the way in which management uh, was sort of delivered to the, the dispersion of management, I should say, you know, going from the governor making 
uh, all these decisions, then going down to the counties, to the mayors, giving that authority, having to go back to the governor to seek approval, uh, and then ultimately ending up with the mayors kind of dictating what they wanted to do in each of their own counties. Uh, what do you think was the best approach through this in overall management, dealing with so many different leaders, with so many different opinions during this time? You know, hindsight's uh, wonderful to have um, in the situation. I, I do think that uh, delegation of decision making down to the counties, which was done all over the country, uh, was a mistake in large part. Uh, it resulted in inconsistent uh, actions being taken. And, and the mayors were, were doing their best, I'm sure, to try to find ways to address issues in their particular county. Here in Hawaii, we, we uh, you know, every county is different. Honolulu's certainly much different than uh, the Hui and, and, and uh, you know, we, we don't have the same rural areas they have on the Big Island and so forth. But um, having said that, um, it did result in inconsistencies. So we had fairly consistent guidance, uh, the, the quarantine period, for example, uh, when you came to Hawaii, that was existing statewide. But when you got past that, you know, some counties were closing uh, restaurants, others were uh, uh, closing other facilities. Uh, on the beaches here, we had lots of different opinions. Uh, I almost got a, arrested on Pemana Beach once for going out, for standing on the beach, watching my my wife swim in because I wasn't, I was just standing on the beach. Uh, so there were there were lots of issues that um, um, uh, came up because of the inconsistencies. Uh, and of course, and then we had the uh, inner island travel that was uh, was troubling. You know, you could go to some islands and not others. So. Um, I think it resulted in inconsistent actions. Um, I, I think uh, it's similar to the state uh, having to deal with the issues more than the federal government. Um, uh, it, it, it was a, um, um, it would have been better if we had more consistent guidance uh, for all the counties uh, as it related to gatherings for for other things as, as well. Um, I, th I think there's generally a, a tendency these days toward delegation of authority and responsibility to the lowest practical level. And, uh, and uh, here in Hawaii, of course, that's government-wise, the counties. Um, so I, I think it was well-intended, uh, but I think we should have probably had uh, stronger state authorities um, and, and exercise those so that we would see more consistency. You know, when you talk about inconsistency and in messaging, one of the issues that we saw was a discord between the governor and the lieutenant governor. Uh, that office was not speaking with one voice throughout much of the pandemic, especially at the start. Um, it felt like the lieutenant governor, you know, at times went rogue, if you will, uh, you know, and, and really challenging the governor very publicly. What was that like to have to manage? Um, because you do want the state authority to speak one, with one voice, of course, as the director of the Department of Health, you work hand in hand with the governor, but the lieutenant governor was tasked with safe travels, eventually tasked with the vaccine rollout. Of course, that came later. But what was that discord like and how did it affect your ability to have a consistent message from the Department of Health? Well, first, let me uh, say, uh, um, Governor and I worked very closely together. Um, I, he was he, uh, he's a good listener and he he uh, he also um, was very oh, much aware of what was happening here in Hawaii and the rest of the country. So I think we were really lucky to have uh, David E. Gay at the helm um, uh, through this outbreak. He, he, uh, he was consistent, steadfast in his, his approach. Uh, Josh uh, Green, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, and I are, are friends. We've been friends for a long time. I think he did his best too. I think he, he saw his role more as a, uh, a spokesperson. Of course, he got more active, actively involved with uh, uh, Safe Hawaii and uh, uh, Travel with Aloha type of uh, programs. Uh, I think he was trying as best he could to try to uh, address some of the issues that the uh, travel industry was having and others as well. I mean, there's no doubt about it, uh, this outbreak affected our economy dramatically. Um, one of the things that surprises me in retrospect is um, how, how um, good the revenues were even during the outbreak, largely because of the federal supports and, and state supports through this. Uh, uh, economically, Hawaii fared pretty well. Uh, some businesses, small businesses that relied entirely on tourism, of course, did not, and, and restaurants and others had a, had a ter terrible time. But uh, I think people recovered um, uh, pretty well. But getting back to the question, uh, I think I think the uh, 
Lieutenant Governor is a good spokesperson, um, and I think he did his best to try to uh, get information out as quickly as he could. Um, I, I, uh, I know the governor and he met uh, frequently. The, we were together on the press conferences often, and, and we had a chance to talk about the issues before then. Um, Josh is a physician. He, uh, you know, he's compassionate. He likes to uh, help people, and I think he was trying to be responsive in large part to uh, lots of individual concerns. And if there were inconsistencies between what he said and what the governor said, I think he was trying to be uh, helpful to uh, whoever he he, uh, he could be. Um, but um, he, he, that's, this, again, is uh, what happened all over the country. We had lots of different opinions. Uh, without that federal guidance and clear on a clear understanding of what directions we should be taking, everyone has their own opinion. And uh, and obviously, the governor and the governor disagreed on some some matters. And it does make it difficult. Um, the governor's my boss, so I, I certainly follow what he says. And and uh, and, and uh, we try to we, we did uh, work with uh, Lieutenant Governor Green uh, very closely through this and. And uh, I think uh, we, got, we got through it really well. I mean, despite all these problems, we still, we had the, by far the lowest rates of COVID and the lowest death rate through my tenure there at the Health Department of any state in the country. Not even, not the states were even close. And it was because I think ultimately things worked out okay. Um, uh, Governor did a good job. And I must say, one of the things that um, uh, Tenegar Green has really tried to do is work closely with the healthcare industry. Uh, Hilton Rathel and others there um, um, did a terrific job. I mean, it's one thing to keep the case numbers down, but it's another thing to keep people uh, alive. And um, the healthcare industry uh, really came 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 through on that one. Um, uh, we were we were really worried about overwhelming the emergency rooms. I'll tell you what, the, the very basic strategy we had for my entire tenure there was just keep the cases down to a level that uh, would not overwhelm in the hospitals until the vaccine came. And and our job was to keep the case numbers down. The healthcare industry was really tasked with trying to deal with the cases that occurred and trying to keep them healthy and making sure the emergency rooms were not overwhelmed and and, uh, and that uh, we had enough uh, ventilators and all of those things. Uh, critical to healthcare uh, were a problem. And I think that's where uh, um, Dr. Green uh, really focused most of his, uh, his attention. But anyway, I, different, different approaches. I, I, but I do just want to quickly follow up because this is continues to be a, a discussed and dissected topic today um, was the management of COVID-19. And, and there are some critics and opponents of the Lieutenant Governor that have accused him of being difficult to work with, citing sources within the Department of Health uh, and some of his opponents saying that he actually caused some confusion with the communications uh, among the leadership. Uh, now, there's no one has, that has publicly come forward and stated these claims, but his opponents are using this against him. Uh, but I ask you, as someone who was there, and, and just to elaborate, do you think these accusations on the lieutenant governor are fair? No, I think, I think I, I, uh, again, I think the lieutenant governor uh, was trying to do his best I, I, one thing you learn in state government um, very early is there are clear lines of authority and responsibility and communication. And uh, um, um, you know, governor tells me what to do. I, of course, advise him and down the line. Um, and that has to that has to have that has to work. Um, uh, that's not necessarily how things work in a hospital and, and, and in other parts of the healthcare industry, but. It certainly is the case in, in government, and, and it has been in the health department since I, I started. So um, I, I think if anyone is is commenting or or um, getting involved with issues that isn't directly in that line of authority, then people get anxious about it. I must say, even in the health department, we we had some problems. Uh, um, health department has three thousand employees, and and uh, uh, some some. Uh, are better communicators than others. Uh, so we, um, you know, we, one of my jobs is to try to get everyone to work together and, and make sure uh, we're on the same page together. Uh, and that was challenging. People were working at home. People were um, not clear on, on who was calling the shots. Uh, uh, the town governor would have a press 
release or press conference. Uh, and usually it was consistent with what the state was saying. Sometimes you get a little ahead of it. Sometimes, uh, sometimes not. Almost invariably, though, the, the, we were all saying the same things. But um, just that confusion was uh, troubling, I think, to a lot of employees. I want to ask you, sort of looking ahead, and and based on your experience at the at the Department of Health, you know, when when COVID first came to the islands, did you do you feel like you were adequately staffed at the department? I mean, you made mention of three thousand employees, but do you feel like you had enough resources? And looking ahead, what would you think that the, the department would need? I know you haven't been at the helm for some time, but just judging on based on when you left. Um, you know, is there is there a way perhaps that we should restructure the Department of Health to respond to crisis, an epidemic response unit, or, you know, is there something specific that could be done so that we are in a better position uh, going forward for the next crisis? Well, it's uh, a good question. And I, uh, and I must say, I think uh, I've always felt the Department of Health was under-resourced in, in lots of different areas, but getting to the infectious disease uh, area, um, Dr. Park, uh, Sarah Park, who was the uh, division chief at the time, um, had put together a plan to try to fill out the uh, department or her division's uh, staffing to be able to better respond to outbreaks, uh, both now and in the future. And, and uh, significant increases in our budget were proposed during the legislative sessions to try to, uh, to make that happen. We thought this was a great opportunity to finally get the people we needed and to be able to respond, getting enough contact tracers, getting uh, uh, the technical resources we needed and so forth. So a lot of time was spent over the legislature trying to push for resources generally to build out the department and um, um, and, and that area. So I, I think still a lot more needs to be done. I think this brought home the fact that infectious diseases are still a huge problem in this country and they're going to continue. Um, COVID will continue in some form or another, and we're going to continue to deal with the flu. I also worry uh, about lots of other emerging infectious diseases that um, we don't worry about today because we've been well vaccinated. This vaccine hesitancy is going to have far-reaching consequences for the school vaccine program, for virtually all the vaccine programs. Diseases like mumps and measles, uh, we never see those now. Uh, because of the high vaccination rates. We, vaccination rates dropped with measles. We're going to start seeing outbreaks like they did in Samoa, um, where hundreds of kids die. That's a small community. Um, it, it, there's still lots of deadly diseases out there we need to keep keep track of. So I think it's critically important uh, to, to maintain and build that program. I, d I have not been tracking what's happening this year in the legislature, but I can't think of an area that's more important. Mental health, um, um, of course, the environmental health issues are, are huge. And that was my main focus for most of my tenure in the health department. Um, but, but in every area, I think more resources are needed. But we do have, they have put together a good budget, and hopefully um, we're going to see that uh, supported. I want, I want to talk a little bit more about the relationship with the legislature and your thoughts with that overall relationship, because one of the more memorable moments of the pandemic was when uh, state senators showed up unannounced to the Department of Health to see what they said firsthand, what was happening within the department and caught uh, you as well as many of the staffers off guard. Uh, what was your relationship like with lawmakers? And, and do you think that that visit by the senators unannounced was something that helped the department to highlight some of the these efficiencies and areas where you needed help or, or was it harmful? Uh, I, I have to say it's harm, it was harmful. I happen to have been over in the uh, governor's office when, when that, that visit occurred. Uh, the legislators came through a back door and and uh, and uh, walked up to uh, the uh, Communicable Disease Division, which happens to be on the fourth floor. And, uh, and there were some staff there. They actually went around and counted heads. Um, and there were fewer people there than um, what they expected, of course, during the middle of the day, people are going to be out in the field. Uh, there are people in other offices. Um, and frankly, a lot of people are working at home. The contact tracers and so forth were, were not in their offices sitting at their desks. So they came back with a bad impression about who's there. They didn't have a chance to talk with me and, and others who I think would have helped, helped them understand better what the situations were. Uh, just the fact they came without being 
annou announcing they were coming and was, was troubling. Um, I think there was a lot of distrust uh, that occurred and, and misinformation that was uh, transmitted during that, that period of time. We spent an incredible amount of time briefing the legislators on, on, on every day, at least a couple times a week, on, on what was, uh, was happening. They had special committees set up. They went on for hours. Uh, so I spent a lot of time over there, as did many of the health department um, staff, uh, trying to explain what the issues were. This surprise visit, I think, was focused on the contact tracing piece and, uh, and to verify that we had X number of contact tracers that went over and wanted to make sure that we were actually had those people on board. You know, we ended up hiring and uh, training about 100 contact tracers and uh, more than that. And that's what we wanted to have on our bench if we needed them. Um, but we don't have, we didn't have that many in the office. So they ended up uh, getting a bad impression of that. And of course that became a big story and uh, it just kind of spiraled into a morass of uh, accusations and, and uh, mistruths. So that's never a good practice, but it happened. I think that, you know, a lot of legislators were frustrated that they, they couldn't do anything. You know, they, they were, we had these long hearings and they were, they were uh, chomping at the bit to do something that would be meaningful. And, you know, we were focused on contact tracing and vaccinations were not there and, and trying to do what we could. But, um, you know, I think everyone was very frustrated during that, that, that period of time, including the legislators. Uh, I attribute a lot of their um, actions or, or things that they were doing to to that sense of uh, frustration. You know, you made mention of the environment uh, earlier in another response, and I just wanted to ask you briefly about Red Hill. It's something that had been on the Department of Health's radar for some time. Of course, uh, after that incident in 2014, Ernie Lau calling for um, adaptations to be made and for those tanks to be looked at, repaired, drained, what have you. Uh, the worst case scenario, if you will, according to him, has happened here in the islands, and we had that pretty massive sp spill, and now we're going to eventually the federal government has you know made a commitment to do it in three you know but in two and a half let's say years uh which officials here on the ground say is way too long what are your thoughts on what happened with red hill and sort of where the department of health was in tracking that issue uh in your tenure there yeah well the navy's been behind the curve on dealing with that for for a long time um the, the, the risks associated with those tanks is well known you know, 20 years ago it was an issue uh, I wrote letters concerned about the, uh, the problem um, when I was previously health director. And, uh, and of course, it surfaced again when I was, again, health director uh, um, 2019, 22, or whenever it was, the 20. Uh, but I, um, um, the, the whole game has changed. Back then, we knew the tanks were getting old. Uh, they wouldn't last forever. And we were very frustrated that nothing was being done to, to address the issue. People were, they, they were basically blowing smoke. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, meanwhile, uh, there was a catastrophic situation developing. Our strategy back then was simply to put the uh, Navy in a position where they had to replace the tanks. And after that, that spill that occurred uh, in 2017 or whatever it was, uh, we thought we had the leverage to, to get them to do that. So we were trying to get them to commit then to uh, a time frame. And even then they were saying it was going to take 10, 15 years to get through the procurement cycle and, and of course, do the design and engineering for the new tanks. But we thought at least we'd get them to, to start moving in that direction. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't any, any uh, final action taken to get them to go there. And, uh, and of course, then they, this thing came up with the... Uh, with the spill and the contamination of the water there in, uh, in around the Pearl, Pearl Harbor area. And, uh, and that's unfortunate that, that that happened. It happened sooner than I thought it was going to happen. So they're, they're now, of course, in a much tighter time frame. But replacing those tanks is not something that is easy. Um, even draining the tanks, as I understand, it's going to take some time. I, I honestly don't know why it's taking years just to get to the point where they can drain the tanks. Maybe they have to figure out alternative fuel sources for some of the vessels that they have on Pearl Harbor. But 
it's um it's frustrating uh i know uh, for everyone it's it's a it's a really a shame that uh, they they had they had the problem one thing people don't appreciate it's impossible to clean up a large spill after it happens i've, I've seen it from hundreds of underground tanks and other situations and uh a large spill is practically impossible to clean up. It has to be prevented, or you need to treat the water. And with petroleum products, it's very difficult to treat water effectively. So, uh, of course, the best strategy is to to uh, to do what's planned now is to get the tanks uh, cleaned up, and uh, and and uh, hopefully uh, enough it'll be done soon enough that we won't see a, a problem. But uh, again, the, the times have changed since. Uh, I was there because this last uh, uh, release that um, caused some significant problems, and um, and, I, and we're in a whole different uh, game now. Unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left, uh, but I did want to ask you. You know, looking back at during this time of managing the Department of Health uh, during this very turbulent time, is there one thing that you would have done differently, and what is the one thing that you are proud that you folks were able to do? Well, let me say first, so I don't forget to say, I, I am very proud, and I think we all here should be proud of the, the uh, how well we did through the course of the epidemic, particularly in those first uh, that first year. Uh, we had we had the lowest rates in the country and the lowest death rates, and it shows that we really care about our people here even more, perhaps than 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 economic issues. So that that's that's something I'm always going to be very proud of. I think uh, the employees of the department have done a terrific job by and large. I was always proud to work with them. It's been my whole career there, most of my career anyway. And I was uh, um, very pleased uh, that they, many of those people still remain and those people who have retired like me, uh, I think are, are feeling the same way. It was a very rewarding job. Uh, I think with the other part of your question, um, um, I think communications uh, has always been a challenge for the department. Uh, we had some, Janice Okubo was terrific. We both dealt with her, I think, and uh, she's retired now. And I think they've got a good team there. But uh, I think there's a lot more that can be done to uh, get the word out. Um, that's, that's, that area has always been under-resourced. There have only been two or three people uh, dealing with health, environmental issues, and everything else uh, in the department. So I think that's needed. Uh, especially needs attention. Uh, some of the folks that are there now are, I think, are doing a good job, but there need to be more of them and, and they need more focused. But, uh, you know, I, I really, uh, there's nothing I would I would do any differently. I, I'm, I'm pleased with uh, what happened. I, I always did my best and um, there's nothing I can look back on and say, gosh, I should have done that or I should have done this. Um, and I think we all, I think everyone's uh, doing their best and, uh, and trying to keep the people in Hawaii healthy. Dr. Bruce Anderson, former director of the Department of Health, thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning. We truly appreciate your insights uh, and your perspective on what happened then and what should happen now. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's nice to talk about these issues again. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy your retirement. Thanks so much for joining us. Aloha. Thank you. Well, you heard a consistent theme throughout the interview there, Ryan, and that is communication. You know, he said that the state and the federal government really needed to speak with one voice. Uh, one of the things that he highlighted early on was the fact that the county mayors had a lot of authority and that having different policies, you know, you could you were allowed to go to the beach and parks on Hawaii Island, but, you know, here on Oahu, Mayor Kirk Caldwell had that strict policy, no butts on the beach. We remember it clearly. Uh, and so all of these different policies in terms of gathering sizes and what was allowed and what wasn't allowed caused a lot of confusion. And, the and you know, the former director saying there that it would have perhaps been better for the state to speak with one voice and have a blanket policy for all of the islands. That said, uh, he consistently highlighted the fact that Hawaii did have some of the lowest numbers when it came to COVID death rates, uh, hospitalizations, and infections, and saying that he's very proud of, of the team that he led there at the department for helping to make that happen. Yeah, I'm working with some of those key policy points. You know, he mentioned that 14-day quarantine period was really essential for helping to keep those numbers down, citing that there were days where we saw single digit cases and some days where we didn't see any new infections early on in the pandemic, which was 
uh, drastically different from what was happening throughout the country. He credited the leadership of the governor, saying that he was very steady throughout, that he did not waver, uh, and saying that he enjoyed that working relationship. Uh, also saying, you know, which has become a political talking point in, in many of the debates that are happening now, uh, that the lieutenant governor's involvement also helped during this time, that he was a good spokesperson. The former director saying that the lieutenant governor did at times uh, maybe jump the gun and and was excited and maybe said things before they had a chance, the department and the, the governor had a chance to be able to formally present some of the information that was being presented, but saying that the governor, uh, the lieutenant governor, I should say, uh, is a physician and somebody that uh, maybe is more used to being able to go out in front of things rather than a structure, following a structure of government that ultimately comes from the direction of the governor, but saying as a whole, regardless of whatever differences and opinions that people may have had uh, coming from that executive branch, that overall the state fared well during this time. Yeah, and also interesting to hear his thoughts moving forward with the department and perhaps battling whatever comes next health-wise to Hawaii, saying that that department really needs bigger resources. It's something that we've heard time and again. Um, you know, they are battling so much right now with COVID, monkeypox, Red Hill, and, you know, whatever else is on the horizon. That's just, a, you know, a sampling of the myriad of issues that that department is responsible for and really saying that they could use more resources then and they likely could use more resources now. Uh, but very interesting to get his thoughts. We appreciate his time. He is, of course, as we noted, on vacation here in Hawaii, splitting his time between here and the mainland. And so, um, you know, the fact that he was able to break away from his vacation for that time, we really, really do appreciate. Uh, on Monday, we're turning the focus back to politics and we'll be joined by Congressman Kai Kaheli, who, of course, is a candidate for governor. That's why we're going to be speaking to those candidates one last time before the uh, general the, the election that is coming out the primary election in August so uh, looking forward to catching up with the congressman uh, we'll also be hearing from Vicky Cayetano next week as well as we gear up for what is uh, expected to be an exciting election night we hope you'll join us next week right back here on Monday for another episode of Spotlight Hawaii have a great weekend aloha aloha this episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs